Hello, I am Lynn Kitchens, and I'm so happy to be with you today. Thanks for being here today. Kind of a crazy day. We are looking at the Psalms. We're learning more about talking to God, and one essential part of talking to God is spending time praising Him. And I even woke up uh, today and was praising God for creation. It was the strangest thing. I went outside. Uh, I didn't go out. Well, I did go out and feed my birds because I'm a bird person. Then I went back in, and Ted said, come and look out these windows. And our entire front yard and backyard were covered in robins. So spring is on its way. But it was sad because they were probably migrating here to get warm. <laughs> in fact, they kind of looked frozen. They weren't doing anything. <laughs> They're just standing in the yard. Today's psalm is about praising God. And you and I, I know we all know it's really important to praise God. But we also know that it's so easy to have conversations with God and it ends up being God waiting for this, help me with that, do this, help this person with that. Amen. And we aren't really just necessarily saying, God, you're worthy of praise. I'm going to spend some time just praising you. I'll have to say that a life where praise is limited is a life where spiritual maturity and joy will also be limited. So this psalm um, I'm excited about, it gives us a blueprint for keeping our praise for God a priority so that it becomes a lasting adoration, not just something we do for, with God now and then. And so as an English major who loves alliteration, I summarize the blueprint into the letter R. We build a life of praise by repeating God's greatness, remembering God's works, reviewing God's attributes, and revering God obediently. And for someone who couldn't say her R's until she was in the fourth grade, that was a mouthful. <laughs> Psalm 111 is in an alphabetical hymn of praise. It's an acrostic psalm. There are 22 lines in it that correspond alphabetically with the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet. The author is not known, but many people believe this was written after Israel returned to their land after they had been captives in Babylon. And if that's true, then think of how encouraging and strengthening this psalm would be for them, and that's why it would be written. And it would be highlighting the amazing works that God did throughout all of Israel's history and reminding them that the worship and the obedience God called them to before their captivity was the same worship and obedience that he expected from them once they were released. Um, just as it always had been, this is what he demanded of them. They needed a lasting adoration for the God who called them to be his own. And we need a lasting adoration for the God who calls us to be his own. And that's why Psalm 5 is also a psalm for us. So when we grow in our adoration, one thing we do is we talk about him, we repeat God's greatness to others. I think today I've already heard about five praises. It's just such a part of our lives, causing us to praise him. So look at Psalm 111. One. The writer says, praise the Lord. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart in the company of the upright in the congregation. So this opening lets us know right off the bat, this is going to be a psalm about adoring God. We can summarize that phrase, praise the Lord, with one Hebrew word, alleluia. The author says, alleluia. And he's intending this psalm to excite the Israelites into the discipline of praise. And so he inserts himself into the middle of it by praising God himself. We can almost picture him you know, waking up in the morning, wanting to praise God, running, getting his breakfast, getting dressed, jumping out in his Fred Flintstone car with the stone wheels, just so he could drive around and tell people about how God great, how great God is. 
Um, I love what Charles Spurgeon wrote about this one verse here. He says, all you his saints unite in adoring Jehovah who works so gloriously. Do it now, do it always, do it heartily, do it unanimously, do it eternally. Even if others refuse, take care that you always have a song for God. Put away your doubt, your questions, your murmuring, your rebellion, and give yourselves up to the praising of God, both with your lips and with your lives. So this writer praises God with his whole heart. It is not a morning chore. It is not a little habit. It is not a rope prayer that he's talking about here. Our adoration grows as we share our praise with others who love God when we can't keep it to ourselves. You know, I get to ask the women to speak in the summer and give their testimonies, and they have lots of different reactions. Sometimes when I ask them, they just run away, or they look ill. But when they say yes, they tell me that one of their favorite things is just meditating on their life reviewing the wonderful works of God in their life and getting to think about some things they had never thought of, some things they had totally forgotten. And so then they can't wait to go share it with other women. And, and as they're sharing it, they get to relive those praises to God. So the writer here mentions two different situations to talk about God's greatness. First, he says we go to the company. That word also is assembly of others who are upright, and this would mean a small group of people, an intimate group of believing friends. Uh, I was in a meeting recently with just a small group of wonderful believing women, and I shared a praise, and I almost got knocked off my seat. They, they just erupted in joy. They were so excited and just praising God, and I just thought, this is so great. It kind of made me relive my praise all over again. And then the psalmist says here, we also share in the congregation. For him, that would be the temple. For us, that would be here. That would be the church. That would be any kind of large gathering of believers. So in both those situations, when we share our praise with others, our praise becomes their praise. Think about it. Don't you love to tell other people's praises? Like the best part is if you're the first one to tell someone else's praise that nobody has heard. I mean, that is the funnest thing in the world because God is being glorified because our, our faith becomes strengthened. And maybe we're having a hard time with our faith. It sort of restores it when we listen to someone's praise. Look at First Chronicles 16. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, call upon his name, and make known his deeds among the people. Sing to him, sing praises to him, and tell of all his wondrous works. And I'd have to say that because of the people and the women in Christ Chapel, that has been a big part of my faith, is listening to your praises. So for lasting adoration, we repeat the greatness of God, but to do that, we have to remember the works of God, our next R. So since the psalmist's goal is to get Israel to praise God, he's about to remind Israel, don't forget these incredible blessings that God has given you all these years as a nation, as a people that he loves. So he wants first, though, to remind them and let them know Praise is more than just remembering. So look at verses two through four. Great are the works of the Lord, studied by all who delight in them, full of splendor and majesty is his work, and his righteousness endures forever. He has caused his wondrous works to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and merciful. So for remembrance to turn into praise, he's saying here, our souls have to be thoughtful as we remember these works. Our souls have to be intentional as we reflect. That's what the word study means. One man said this, deep reflection will always stir the thoughtful soul to praise. And I think that's true. The more one gazes, the more one sees. 
The discipline is getting ourselves to do the gazing. So it's not enough to delight in what God has given us or things he's done for us and stop there. You know, I was thinking, that's how a young, selfish child behaves because they don't know any better. And I'm sure this has happened to you. You buy a young child a toy. You give it to them. They grab it from you. The parents of the child make the child thank you for the gift. Then they run away with it, they play with it a little while, in an hour they sort of forget entirely about the gift. Um, I gave my granddaughter Alice this doll that was just everything to her at Christmas, and about a few weeks ago I said, how are you enjoying that doll? She said, oh, Nan, I don't like that anymore. (laughs) Okay, already forgotten. Hopefully, when an adult gets a gift, we admire it. We're thankful for it. So we have to be adult about our gifts that God gives us. We should take the time to not just use them and forget them, but hold them. Hold them closely in our heart. Be grateful. Treasure them. Look for the deeper realities that are inside of them. Here the psalmist says, all the works of God are great. That means every little thing he does is a great thing for us. They're full of splendor, majesty. They spring from his righteousness. So it takes some meditation, some studying, some observation to be able to see that and know that that's true. Verse 4 also tells us, though, that God's going to help us in that. He'll help us remember his wondrous works, partly by the fact that they're just so obvious. Now, of course, for Israel, those miracles were the most obvious things ever. The parting of the Red Sea, food falling from heaven. I mean, they were worthy to be remembered. But also in his grace and mercy, we remember his works today because we have this, because we have each other because we have his spirit in our heart, and he writes those wonderful works on our hearts. I was so excited to read about this um, science laboratory in Cambridge, England, called the Cavendish Laboratory, named after an 18th century English chemist named Henry Cavendish, a very English name, I thought. Inscribed over the entrance to their building is a verse for every believing scientist. And guess what verse it is? Psalm 111, 2. Great are the works of the Lord, and they are pondered by all who delight in them. Studied, observed, noticed, grateful. It's important to take time to understand the handiwork of God in our lives. So I want to look at what this psalmist has to say about some of these works for Israel. Verse 5, he provides food for those who fear him. He remembers his covenant forever. So this is pretty obvious. The psalmist is saying, hey, remember how God provided food for you? Maybe the 40 years of manna while they were doing their wilderness wanderings. But maybe also when Jacob and his sons were in a famine and they fled to Egypt, discovered the brother Joseph there who ended up feeding that family as they grew into a nation, he provided food for them. But the point in this verse really is, God alone has been your provider. All these years of your history, God's providing for you throughout your journeys. And it wasn't a thing they did. There was nothing worthy about them. This was an act of God because he loved them. By providing food for Israel, he displayed faithfulness to his covenant, the covenant that God gave Abraham and the covenant that God gave Moses, that blessings awaited Israel, descendants, land, that they would be a mighty nation like the stars in the sky and through Israel, that all the families on the earth would be blessed. That would be us. Verse 5 is about us, too, the church. It reminds us 
that God is our great provider as we journey through life. And it's nothing that, it's not because of our worthiness that God is such a provider for us. It's because he loves us. He's our provider. And so the nation of Israel, from them, a savior was born to the whole world. He offers to be a faithful provider for everyone who believes in him. And his loving care supplies Everything that we need, our salvation, our hope, our strength. He promises to be our sustenance on this earth, on our journey on this earth, and he is, and we know because of that that we can trust his promises just as Israel trusted their covenant. Look at 2 Peter. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence, by which he's granted to us his precious and very great promises, so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. So by providing for our needs, God displays his faithfulness to all of his promises in the word of God to us. There was another divine miracle that demonstrated God's commitment to the covenant. Look at verse 6. He has shown his people the power of his works and giving them the inheritance of the nations. First of all, the author reminds Israel, okay, he has shown his power, again, in their deliverance from Egypt, in their um, perseverance and preservation in the wilderness. Those things are obvious. But here he's speaking about Israel inheriting the land that God promised them, the land of Canaan. And the possession of the promised land didn't come about by human might. It was God's divine power and the working of many miracles that conquered those pagan nations surrounding them. From King David's time to Joshua's time, God was demonstrating to the nation of Israel his incredible power as he conquered all these ungodly nations that surrounded them. He was bringing Israel victory. God made the heritage of the heathen the heritage of Israel. And without an inheritance of their own, God conquered Canaan for Israel. That's the power of God. And I'm So glad he's that powerful because that same power offers us an inheritance today when we believe in the gift of his son. Because without an inheritance of our own, God conquered death to bring us life. Look at Colossians 1. Giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sin. Because of our sin, we lived in a land that was dark. That was our life. But through the power of God, we've inherited a kingdom of light, the eternal kingdom of Christ. We didn't have the power to make that happen, but God did. So from your childhood to today, it was God that was working all around you to overwhelm and overcome and conquer your enemies. It was God that fought for you. It was God that died for you. It's God that lives for you. He delivered you from your own kind of enslavement. He delivered you from your own wilderness wanderings. His power overcame all of us. One author said this about that. If you're under the power of evil and you want to get under the power of God, cry to him to bring you over to his service. Cry to him to take you into his army. He'll hear you. He'll come to you. And if need be, he'll send a legion of angels to help you to fight your way up to heaven. God will take you by the right hand and lead you through your wilderness over death, right into his kingdom. That's what the Son of Man came to do. Amen. Okay, the psalmist has more gifts to remember. Let's look at verse 7 and 8. 
The works of his hands are faithful and just, and his precepts are trustworthy. They are established forever and ever to be performed with faithfulness and uprightness. How do we know that God's works are just and trustworthy? We look at another gift that God gave Israel, his laws, his precepts that proved to be so trustworthy for them. So he gave them manna. He gave them Canaan, but he gave them his law. So can you imagine a few million people wandering around in the desert? What kind of chaos it would be if they didn't have godly direction? What would that be like? I could see one Israelite saying to another, I'm eating your goat for lunch today. (laughs) You may not eat my goat for lunch today. That's wrong. Who says? Who says? The law of God provided for them, gave them divine precepts for health, for community, for worship, and they were proven entirely reliable, totally enduring. Unlike man's laws, this verse says, that change in our fallible, God's word stands forever and ever. What God has said will never be unsaid. God acts in eternity and for eternity, and so all his work, including his word, abides forever, and so he performs them faithfully and uprightly. Psalm 33 tells us on our verse sheet, for the word of the Lord is upright, all his work is done in faithfulness, he loves righteousness and justice, the earth is full of the steadfast love of the Lord. So God's laws For Israel were the essence of enduring truth and justice. A great reason for Israel to be praising God. And so it's not hard for us to recognize we can praise God for these same truths because in our hands is a treasure beyond comprehension. We have the very words of God here. It's a gift from above. How do we know they're trustworthy and true? We live them out. And as we journey through this life, living out the words of God, we realize my life's changing. Who I am is changing. These promises are true. I have a map. It's a blessed map. And if I follow it, I'm going to find all the joy God wants me to find. God's word is our blessed map, guiding us onto God's righteous path. I was reading some fun quotes about the Bible, but I love this one. Warning, Bible study can be (laughs) habit-forming. Putting the principles into practice can cause loss of anxiety, decreased appetite for lying, cheating, stealing, and hating. And it may cause symptoms of growing sensations of love, peace, joy, and compassion. That's what the Word does for us. Like Israel... God's word brings wisdom into our wilderness chaos, gives us a way to get on God's path. Jesus knew that. I love what he said in Luke 11. Jesus said, blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and keep it. That's the blessing, keeping it, obeying it. Then the psalmist closes his list of God's great works. Let's look at verse 9. He sent redemption to his people. He has commanded his covenant forever. Holy and awesome is his name. God provided redemption, one of God's greatest works, removing and rescuing people from their oppression and their sin. And I think the psalmist was thinking here of all the redemptive acts of God that surrounded the nation of Israel for all those years connected to the covenant with Abraham. Look at 1 Peter 2. You are a chosen race, speaking of Israel, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, Now you have received mercy. So because of God's covenant with Abraham, 
Those who weren't a people are a people. Those who didn't know the one true God, now the only nation that knew God is their father. Those who were enslaved in Egypt were delivered by God's mighty hand. Those who had no country to call their own received the promised land. And then through his law, God showed Israel how they could have a relationship with him. Look at Deuteronomy 4. Moses says, what great nation is there that has a God so near to it as the Lord our God is to us whenever we call upon him? And what great nation is there that has statutes and rules so righteous as all this law that I set before you today? And then along with all these things in his law, God gave Israel a sacrificial system that would point to the great redemption of God that he would offer all nations, redemption through the blood of a sacrificial lamb of God. Every Passover celebration was a picture of Christ to come who would shed his blood to release us from sin, beginning with the very first Passover, the night that Israel was going to um, escape from Egypt and that slavery. They received these instructions, Exodus 12. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male, a year old. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats, and you shall keep it until the 14th day of this month when the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill their lambs at twilight. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are, and when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and no plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. Remember... In Egypt, the Hebrew people took the blood of the sacrificed lamb and put it over their doorpost, actually representing a cross on each side, probably the pail of blood at the bottom, across the top of the door. And that death angel passed over their houses while Egypt suffered the final and plague of the death of their firstborn son. This is a story for us. This is our story. When we accept Christ's work on the cross, our hearts are sprinkled with the blood of our Savior. And the wrath of God passes over us. This is our redemption through Christ our Lamb. We are rescued from the oppression of our sins. 1 Peter 1 tells us, knowing that you were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. One of my favorite pictures in the New Testament is this very thing. When John the Baptist sees Jesus coming to him to be baptized, and he stops and introduces him to the entire world as the Savior, the Lamb who was a Savior. Look at John 1. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Redemption, God's redemptive work on the cross is connected to his unconditional love for us. So when we have the discipline to dwell on these great works of God, we will be growing into a person of praise, reflecting closely on God's works, turns remembrance into praise. But there's another discipline we can do that's attached to remembrance, and that is reviewing God's attributes. In order to mature in our adoration of God, we have to look for his attributes that are behind his actions. Um, I I almost was going to tell you the story because I sound really dumb in it. I was really dumb. (laughs) I was at the hospital district a while ago and at this four-way crossing and this Nice car pulled up next to me. This woman jumped out and started screaming this story to me about her husband was in the back of her car and something was wrong with her car and they needed money to buy this thing to her car to get help for the man. Now, we're in the hospital district. 
I, I didn't even think about it. I just got so into her story, and she's like, yeah, give me money, quick, quick. She's like this, and trying to get other cars to stop. So I took a 20 out of my car and gave it to her. She goes, come on, come on. <laughs> Fortunately, I had no more money. She might have gotten the rest of my money. I'm thinking, this man is dying in the car. He needs money. Now, how does that make sense? <laughs> Ah, uh, then the worst part was they drove away. And I think she got a lot of money. She kind of ran from person to person doing this. What I, what I was sort of mostly offended about was that she didn't care about me at all, that I was so worried for her, that I was caring for her. It didn't matter. She took the money and ran or drove away. If we treat God that way, we're the loser. We lost an opportunity to praise him. When he hands us a gift, there are so many attributes of God we can discover if we take the time to look at them so we can praise him well. It's reviewing the attributes of God which motivated those works we remembered in the first place. Not just... Thanks for the new job, God. Thanks. But you are so faithful and generous. Not, thanks for changing this situation, da 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 da. But, God, you are so trustworthy. You are so loving. We stop and take the time to look a little deeper. Once we remember the works of God, we can learn more about God. You notice the writer of this psalm, he couldn't help himself from doing that. Did you notice that? he just throw in these attributes of God. I jotted them down. When he said the works of God are full of splendor and majesty, he praised the righteousness of God. In that verse, righteousness meant integrity, integrity to keeping the promises of the covenant. Then he says, God is gracious and merciful because he causes his works to be remembered and grace and mercy are picturing the undeserved kindness of God. And then when we looked at God's law, we learned that he's faithful and just, meaning his words are perfect and perfectly formed and performed. They are performed with God's uprightness, meaning his, he's immutable, he's unchanging. And when the psalmist takes a breath at the end of his list of God's works, he cries out and prays, holy, awesome, are you God? Meaning that God's perfection in all of his works, his actions, and his character are awe-inspiring. So the more we understand who God is, along with what he does, the more we will praise him, and it will be a deeper praise. When we treasure God's attributes, it leads us to praise him in spirit and in truth because we know him better. Our praise can be richer and truer. Now, none of this is possible if we don't revere God obediently. So let's look at that, starting with the end of verse 9 because it really is connected to verse 10. So holy and awesome is his name. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All those who practice it have a good understanding. His praise endures forever. So the holiness and the awesomeness of God, what we see here is it needs to be feared. The root word in awesome is the same root word for fear or revere God. So those who revere God he says, um, and practice it, other translations say, obey it. Obey his commands. That's what practice means there. They're going to find their lives blessed with spiritual wisdom that the rest of the world cannot have. Those who follow God and God's ways will be given a gift of great wisdom. So we have to praise God with both our lips and our lives. That's the practice part. That's the obedience part. It isn't enough to revere God, fear God, 
but then just do what we want. Just live life our way. Because that kind of life, then your faith is based on experience. It cannot lead to lasting adoration. But we also want to not be the other way. It's not enough to legalistically obey his commands, but have no personal relationship with him. To not be humbled and awed by him, but together, reverence and obedience, we will find those deep in the life of someone who has developed a habit of praise, deep humility, and deep obedience, they're going to bring about deep praise. So to build a life of praise, we repeat God's greatness to others. We remember God's mighty works. We review God's attributes, and we revere and obey God. And listen to this quote of um, an author I read. This pleasure of praise will be ours forever. This will be our employment in eternity ever passing into deeper and fuller appreciation of the works of God, and then breaking into rapturous songs. And guess what? We're all going to have good voices. (laughs) That's going to be great. Praising together. So let's start now, and let's begin this lasting adoration. Let me pray. Father, you are mighty, good, holy, awesome. That's our song today to you from our hearts, from our lips, and from our lives. We love you, and we pray that you remind us throughout the days to stop and remember just how great you are. Pray this in Christ's name. Amen.